stand for so long. <laughs> when they had gotten near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey, and tied and a colt with her. Untie them. Bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them. And he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks around the road. Others cut branches from the trees, spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of God for the children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Children desiring Sunday school may attend with Lydia. If that is your uh, desire, everyone else may be seated. Whew. Not a great start when you're looking for the 37th cha 32nd chapter of Matthew, and it's just not there. <laughs> Y'all are in for something fun today some good energy. Well, <laughs> similarly, uh, this is a great story to follow that. I, when I was in seminary all those many moons ago, um, we had a chapel service. And chapel, everybody who's involved in chapel service at seminary was a seminary student. Although it's being organized by someone else, you got requested to participate, to be asked to preach at the chapel service, big high honor. It, you know, it's just one of these, it's in between, right? You have what you're learning about in class in terms of practice of how to be a pastor and your field placement or your internship where, you know, you're kind of given the depending on the church you are, like how much authority you have. Chapel, you're around all of your peers. So it's one of those, I'm getting to preach. Hmm. Or I get to help in some form or fashion. I was notified that I got to help with communion. Now, I don't know about I mean, I can't remember what it's like. I said, when I got told I get to help with communion, there's one thing I wanted to do, the bread. Because the bread's the real communion. That's the whole game. This is the body of Christ given for you. That's where the magic is. First off, no, it's not. <laughs> it's false theology. Christ is equal in both. Each. It's fine. Both elements. But you couldn't tell 23-year-old seminary student Luke Nelson that. For me, it was the bread. This is Jesus given for you. You know what I got? The cup. <laughs> cup of salvation for you cup of salvation for you. Got the, the intinction line. Everybody's got their little pinch of bread and they're going for the cup. And I'm just, oh, I can't believe this. Professor asked me to be the cup bearer. Oh. Cup of salvation. And I'm just, woe is me. But we had a resident bishop, which is what a, what a title. But he was a retired bishop if you've been around Methodism long enough, there's a chance you met him because he retired out of Iowa. He was the first African-American bishop in Iowa, Charles Wesley Jordan. You got to be a bishop with a name like that. African-American, lovely man. I, I, he, being a resident bishop at a seminary, you get to teach a class or two. I had a class with him, and I was serving in an African-American church. So he actually, when he heard that, he's like, I'm coming. And he, like, he came to my, my first sermon there. It was a, quite an experience. He's in line to receive communion. He didn't make it to every chapel service, but he's there. And I'm sitting there pouting away that I have the cup. 
And then Bishop Jordan steps in front of me and he's shaking. He's got the bread in his hand, he's eyeballing me. And have you ever had that look from another human being that it's like they looked right at your soul? You feel this glare that just pierces through every mask you've ever put up. Every false pretense. And Bishop Jordan just looks me right in the eyes. And the words barely come out. I, I just, cup of salvation given for you. He puts his other shaking hand on my hand holding the cup and tinks the cup, he hand, just holding back tears, says amen, and backs up and walks away. I was changed. I was humbled. Suddenly, the, what I was holding inside of me, this like competition, it just melted away in a single instant with one look from this man. It all changed. And it reminds me, whenever I think that I know something, that I've earned something, that I've studied the thing, that I have leveled up, that I have obtained the stuff to do the thing, I'm reminded again and again to remain humble and curious in the face of God. Because that's what Charles Wesley Jordan was for me. He was, he was Jesus looking me right in the eye. And I have to remain humble and curious. I'm reminded of this going into today because I am a little embarrassed by the Palm Sunday scripture reading. And not just because I thought there was a 30 second chapter of Matthew. <laughs> I'm embarrassed for the crowds. I'm embarrassed for them because I like to think that I would have known. Right? I would have been like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. We all have the, f the, the, the knowledge of what's going to happen. All these people shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. They're saying the right thing. Son of David, Hosanna in the highest. That's the right thing you should say. And in a couple of days, they're going to start shouting crucify. I, if I had lived there, I would have known the significance of the moment. I mean, the story of it all. Jesus ends up saying, go get a colt and a donkey. Did you hear that? It's them. It's two. It's not one. It's two. For our scriptural literalist friends, how did Jesus ride two animals? Was it like skis? <laughs> Because that would be fun artwork. And it is fun artwork. Go ahead and give it a Google. <laughs> Rides it like, like, come on. The, the reason behind it, the, the whole, the, the thing about the uh, colt, the foal, the child, the interpretation of that is an unridden animal, an unbroken, it's not trained, which is a kingly prerogative. To be able to say that no one has ridden this animal before is to say that this is the entrance of a king. It's like when you get your new car. It still has the new, it's got the new donkey smell. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so he's riding the new donkey into Jerusalem. And they start cutting branches, right? Palm fronds. Now, it, the thing about this, about... <sighs> What would be of the age, so Jesus is like in his mid-30s when this whole thing goes down. People who were 70 or 80 years old, and people did live to be that long, it's getting past into adulthood, that was the hard part. But if you got there, you could be there. If you're 70 or 80, this symbol had a special significance for the people of Jerusalem. About a generation before Jesus showed up, there was a revolt that got Jew uh, for like a very brief time, Jewish independence. It was led by the man Judah the Maccabee, which is translated Judah the Hammer. And if you ever wanted a cool nickname, the Hammer. Yeah, 
Judah the hammer. And when he printed money, the symbol of the Jewish independent state, palm branch. Palm branch. So for the Jews walking in, as Jesus is riding, skiing two animals into Jerusalem, and they're laying down this, this is a sign. He's our king. He's our, he is our political freedom. That's, that's his present. He's not just a king. He's going to usher in this whole thing. And they are projecting onto Jesus what they want God to be. Let me say that again for the people in the back. You in particular. They are projecting onto, God, onto Jesus what they want God to be. Well, that's something I have never done. <laughs> Thank God we're all so much more evolved that we no longer project. Even when we have all the right symbols, we have all the right tapestry of church and God. We are correct in our theology. My friends, humility and curiosity will inoculate you. You will only be as big. You will only grow to the size of your God. You will only be as big as your own concept of God. If your God is narrow-minded, legalistic, dogmatic, contained in a box, contained in a church, contained in a robe or a collar or whatever manufacturing, if that is where your God is, if that's as big as your God is, that is as big as you will ever be. For the vast majority of the interactions outside in a world of what Christians have held is a God that is way too small for me. Because the God of so many followers of Jesus, they reflect our own prejudices. A God that only agrees with me. A God that reflects my political leanings. A God that reflects my personal choice of what my God shows up for my kind of worship. Not th that kind of worship is a little out of bounds for God. This kind of opening up and allowing yourself to remain humble in the face of God and endlessly curious about what God might be saying or doing hopefully moves you in the right direction throughout Holy Week. Because I will say this, we move from today and we're going to celebrate Holy Communion this week we remember, like this, can, this meal can be a lot of things. I mean, you want to talk about projecting. This meal can be, depending on when you have it. But this week we are called to remember the first time this happened in very specific terms. So the, God, the, 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 the disciples who are gathered with Jesus in the upper room, fun little trivia, you know what the upper room is in Greek? Cataluma. You can say it. Cataluma. You know where the other two places this was? The Cataluma. The Cataluma is said, the, second, the next time it's said, that's where they are when the Holy Spirit descends. The other time, the birth of Jesus. We don't change it around because nobody likes mess, messing with Christmas. But the birth of Jesus and the birth of the church the birth of this institution, same space. Now, those gathered with Jesus, most of them had been with Jesus for a couple of years now. How much did they understand of his teaching at the time? Eh, they may have gotten some references, but did they fully understand? I mean, you can, they could have gone back. They heard the sermon where Jesus said, 
He did the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus had a church of 5,000, right? What a great start to the movement. And then Jesus says to them, unless you eat my body, unless you drink my blood, you're not going to be a part of this. And everyone went, thanks for the lunch. (laughs) We're out. (laughs) Drew a line. And those that remained were the 12. Jesus went went from a church of 5,000 to 12. The district superintendent would not be pleased. (laughs) I don't think the bishop would be, the bishop would be crying for a whole different reason. (laughs) But they had heard that teaching and went, okay. And then they're in the upper room. All of them. All of them. The ones who ate with Jesus at this meal, you had, you had Peter, who in just a few hours wouldn't have been able to like, recognize Jesus, wouldn't have had the courage to say that he knew who Jesus was, even to a child. You ever struggled with cowardice? With ever being the one who's like, should I say something? I don't know, and, and, and maybe you regret, you, you look back and you're like, you know, I should have said something. I should. I really should. Jesus offers himself to you too. You had Thomas at the point of the resurrection. His 11 best friends are all, 10, his 10 best friends are saying, we saw him. He's resurrected. We, he, was, he was here. He was here. He walked through the wall. He said he loves us. He told us he was going to send us out. He was here. And Thomas, out getting coffee for some reason, he turns and says, I, I got to see the, I, I mean, yeah, 10 of you are all saying he was here. I got to see him. Jesus knew this about Thomas and offered him his body and blood anyway. He invited him to that institutional meal. The man who's sitting at the table, whose pocket was weighed down with silver, who had betrayed Jesus that very night, Jesus offers to him a seat at that table to partake in that meal. I already mentioned Peter, but here's another one. Peter so missed the boat on Jesus' message of love, grace, forgiveness, non, non-violence, that when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out a sword and hacks off an ear of the Roman soldier. And Jesus tells him to put away the sword and then heals the Roman soldier. That's how far the disciples had missed it. How humble they must be. How curious of this institutional meal to say, who am I to accept it? It's not about you, my friends. It's not about how bad you've been. It's not about your faults, your insecurities. It's not how you've projected unto Jesus all the things you wanted him to be. The love of God is about one thing, God loving you, God choosing you, God always chooses you. And God has said, through Jesus, has said, this meal is the way that you will know always and forever that I choose you because I love you, I made you, I shaped you, I formed you, and I am filling you with grace. And on a side note, it should be for everyone. Wherever you are on, the, on a journey of spiritual life, or no journey at all in your opinion, when you look at the people who sat with Jesus at that table, how many of them were confident 
Some had already made up decisions. They had made up their mind over who Jesus was. One made up his mind that Jesus was a fraud and needed to be arrested in order for the real thing to happen. They had gotten it wrong so many times, and yet Jesus offers forgiveness and grace again and again and again. As it's offered here, as it's offered to you. This is why communion is open regardless of church membership, regardless of Christian profession. As it was said, communion can be uh, a conferring grace. I've lost the word. But it can be the moment where you experience the presence of God, which is why everyone is offered communion, regardless of age as well. I have heard, a par- I have heard adults tell me, well, the kids don't get it. Did the disciples get it? Well, they have to have uh, appropriate reverence. Did Judas... Sure, they don't have a cognitive ability to give that assent. But you want to compare your cognitive assent to God? God has always chosen us. I want to lean toward, if I am going to fail and I stand before the judgment seat, may I be judged for being overly grace, to be abundant in grace, to be abundant in mercy. Because if that was a sin, then that's a sin I learned from Jesus. If it is a sin to be abundant in grace and mercy, to be overflowing with forgiveness, if that is a sin, that is the sin I learned from Jesus. Because I have been humbled more than I care to admit in any one sermon. So I'm serving a church and um, confirmation student, I'm raising them up, got this confirmation student, and she says she wants to pursue ministry. She's going to seminary. And she, I see it in her eyes, she's talking about, I'm like, well, I want you to help me with communion. You do? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, come on up, you know? And, um, They had these white choir robes, so I put her in the white choir robe. This is the only thing you can't really wear, uh, but I'm like, you can, wear a, you can wear one of these. They're called albs. Anybody can wear them. They're Christian symbols. This is the thing that says ordained pastor. So I put one on her, and we have the communion. She had served communion before, but not since she had declared she was going to be an ordained minister, right? So then she's standing by me. She's got the cup, and we get done with the communion, and I'm like, do you want to debrief? Yeah, I have to debrief. And I'm like, okay. She's like, I just need to know. Why is everyone crying? Like, I caught, we're having communion. And every person, as they come up, I'm not, I, I have the cup in my hand. And everyone's crying as I say the cup of salvation given for you. I look at her and I go, this is your home church. You were baptized here. Yeah, but some of these folks are, str- like, they're, I've seen them. They've been watching you since you were this big. They've been praying for you since you were this big. Never underestimate what people see in you. And suddenly, I'm on the other side of this, watching someone get humbled. So sisters and brothers, when you come forward today, come with a humility of heart and abounding curiosity. Would you pray with me?